Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Williamsburg City Council work session of Monday, December 7th. Ms. Felica, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Rogers. Here. Ms. Ramsey. Here. Mayor Pons. Here. Vice Mayor Dent. Here. Mr. Maslin. Here. Thank you. I just want to um, thank everybody for joining us virtually um, with the governor's latest um, uh, executive order. We felt that out of abundance of caution, it would be best that we go ahead and meet virtually uh, just to keep everybody that much more safe and healthy. So thank you for joining us um, virtually and those who may be watching on TV. Um, we have uh, first item is council preview. Um, Mr. Trivet. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So on Thursday, we're going to do uh, the budget amendment for the end of the year. Uh, we will be uh, asking you to consider a contract with Khajiit Wireless for our wireless pilot program in Highland Park. Um, we're going to be talking about a lease agreement with York County for the old Crossroads Group Home Facility on Moortown Road. And then finally, the presentation and acceptance of the city's uh, CAFR report. Good. Thank you. Takes us now to public comments. I understand we have uh, two written comments. Ms. Felico, would you be kind enough to read those into the record, please? Yes, sir. The first one is from Juan Cheng, Thomas Liu of 200 Stadium Drive. Council members, my name is Thomas Liu. I'm a student junior at William & Mary, and over the past 15 months, I've also been a member of the city's Neighborhood Balance Committee. First of all, I would like to thank Council Member Rogers the city manager and Carolyn for providing me with the opportunity to serve on the NBC and to represent William and Mary students in this vital discussion. Throughout my time with the NBC, I've not only participated firsthand in local affairs, but most importantly, as a member of the Williamsburg community, I've also gotten to know our staff and our neighbors. After learning about our community's current situation, listening to expert presentations, and participating in thoughtful discussions with fellow committee members, we were each tasked to identify top short-term and long-term concepts for the City Council's review. I would like to use this opportunity to bring two short-term concepts, the Certified Rental Program and the Nuisance Property Ordinance, both of which happen to be on the short list of recommended concepts to the City Council's attention. Both concepts are win-win-wins for the city owners and student and non-student renters. The certified rental program would help ensure the rental property's quality and help attract renters to lease the property in a competitive market. I would recommend that the respective property managers be involved in the program in addition to the landlords themselves. Lastly, I am encouraged by the council's determination to have conversations around affordable housing. I hope that NBC's list of affordable housing concepts can serve as a basis of discussion for the upcoming affordable housing work group and have the group include the voices of William & Mary students, faculty, and staff, a key constituency of our Williamsburg community. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing the City Council adopt the Neighborhood Balance Committee's recommendations in the near future. Thank you. The next one is from Matthew Boyer, Sadler Center, 200 Stadium Drive. As a student on the Neighborhood Balance Committee, I want to thank you for endeavoring to include student voices as part of this locality's decision-making process. This allowance strengthens the communal bond between college and city and allows for inclusive policy exploration and implementation. With this said, I have listed those policy points that as a student, I find the most worthy and relevant of your attention. The first program that I would urge adoption of is the Certified Rental Property Program. From a student perspective, such a program would ensure uniform quality in the existing rental stock in the Williamsburg market. If adopted, the program's outlined requirements would comprise a quality assessment, landlord completion of a training course, and enrollment in an emergency notification system. That said, I believe there should be an added requirement, and that is that if an absentee landlord owns a property and they utilize a property manager, then the property managers should have to show completion of the training course as well. The rationale behind this is that renters deal with their PMs more than they do with the absentee landlords in this scenario. The second program that I would urge adoption of is the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. While Williamsburg may not currently be entitled to receive community development block grants from HUD, 
a successful application could remedy this. While time intensive, such a project provides a unique opportunity for students at the College of William and Mary, especially those in government and public policy courses, to work alongside local city officials in the grant writing process. Opportunities for collaboration in this matter could take many unique and exciting forms and provide real world experience to students and help for local city officials. Besides these two significant suggestions, both the nuisance property ordinance and trash cart ordinance would work to keep our community disturbance and trash free. There exists no downside in instituting either of these. Finally, as a student and member of this community, I wish to oppose the repeal of the four person allowance. While this rule has encountered a degree of politicization, I think we must ask ourselves what such a repeal would accomplish. Currently, as was presented to the NBC, there are 36 properties with the four-person housing approval. Those in favor of abolishing this rule cite arguments that our communities would be made more affordable and retain the essence of single-family neighborhoods. While there may be some validity to these claims, if affordability is the repeal stated goal, we need to consider if abolishing this rule will make three, four, and $500,000 houses any more affordable for the individuals we are trying to attract into our neighborhoods. The median price for the majority of these 36 homes are unaffordable for the vast majority of Americans. Another dimension to this problem, which, resolves around, which, excuse me, which revolves around affordability for students, is that these houses with four person allowances, in some cases, rent their rooms on a per month basis. Instead of a student having to pay $1,000 for their own apartment, they can rent a room at a more affordable rate from properties that do not have the four person allowance. Affordability must be considered from more than one angle. Again, my sincerest thanks to those who made this committee possible and were kind enough to include student voices. Wishing you all a very healthy and happy holiday season. Thank you. Mr. Barm, do, you, do we have any um, callers? No, sir, there are no call in people on the line. Okay. So we'll move on and we have another open forum. So if anybody wants to uh, call in, they're, they're welcome to do that. Uh, should be coming up shortly on the agenda. Uh, but first, uh, item four on the agenda is uh, background presentations. And we have a presentation and update regarding the William, Mar William and Mary Global Film Festival and the Great Williamsburg Adventure Race. We have with us Adam Stackhouse and Liz Sykes. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank hey. you so much for having us. So we do have a brief presentation to talk about the two events that you mentioned, and we will start with the Global Film Festival. Uh, yeah, the Global Film Festival took place uh, January 30 to February 2 of this year. Feels like eight years ago, uh, but it did happen this year. And we submitted this report that you're gonna see uh, coming up in these slides back when the event wrapped. But we're here to kind of just go over it and answer any questions and kind of talk about the state of the festival. Uh, this year was the 13th year of the event and it continues to grow, which we're very excited about. You can see some numbers here, but total attendance uh, got just shy of 3000 attendees this year. You can see the breakdown between the main venue, the Kimball Theater and the smaller venue of Tucker Theater. More student tickets than ever were allotted, uh, over 1,100 free tickets that sponsorship helps uh, to provide at a value of over $12,700 to students who are able to attend screenings and panels uh, as part of the festival. We had 24 alumni presenters more than ever do workshops. There were 23 workshop sessions. All workshops were free and open to the public, to students, to people from out of town. Anyone who wanted could come and get that first-hand experience and meet with people who work in the entertainment industry from all over the country. A uh, very exciting part of the workshop. We continue to get great feedback on and we're excited to, to have as part of the GFF. Down the bottom, you see some sponsorship numbers, more sponsors than ever, uh, obviously including City of Williamsburg, uh, 21 sponsors in this year's festival, and over $85,000 were donated uh, for festival programming. We continued to have a robust marketing campaign for the festival um, in both print and digital publications. So you can see some of them listed here, the Virginia Gazette, the Daily Press, the William Mary Alumni Magazine, 
and then social media platforms. And through ticket purchases, we were able to track those who purchased their tickets online. And of those purchases, 34% were from outside of Williamsburg. So you can see the cities in Virginia that people traveled from to attend the festival, as well as out-of-state purchases from DC, Maryland, and North Carolina. Hotel bookings represented 96 room nights during the festival for an average cost of $73 per night. And it brought in just over $16,000 in total in revenue for the festival. And the film festival itself booked 23 rooms for all the special guests and alumni who attended and presented. Uh, one of the things we really love about the festival is getting everybody involved in the area around the Kimball Theater and people like the sense of community and people getting involved in the, you know, also spending money in the local downtown area, which I know is a important part with our partnership with the city of Williamsburg. To that end, uh, this year, one of our new exciting things, Illy Cafe was a festival headquarters. So we had this kind of ongoing flow of people who would go to a movie or a performance at the theater and then go across Merchant Square and get a free cup of coffee with their ticket or pass. And so you saw conversations with people from out of town talking to locals or citizens talking to students. And it was really nice and really well received and all the feedback we got. Uh, speaking of feedback, we put out a festival survey to all the people who bought through our online platform. We had a 20% response rate. Out of that 20%, we found out that 48% of the people filling out the survey attended for the first time for the festival this year. 70% uh, said they dined in a nearby restaurant during the festival, and 38% said they went shopping during the festival. Um, additionally, here's our website traffic. We're very happy to have over 35,000 visits to the website during the month of the festival for people checking out the programming, the related uh, sponsors and the businesses involved with the festival. I mentioned the sponsors a couple of minutes ago, but there's a detailed breakdown here, obviously including the city of Williamsburg. Uh, one new name on there would be the Virginia Film Office, who we established a partnership with last year uh, and who were involved supporting this year's programming. Very excited to have them and hope to do so again in the future. And speaking about the programming, we had 24 alumni presenters. We're very excited that we continue to gain momentum having alumni come back to be involved in the festival. And those alumni helped present 23 professional workshops, which were free and open to the public as well as the William & Mary community. 33 students received credit in some capacity for their involvement in the festival, whether that was an internship in the fall youth filmmaking program or in the spring internship supporting the production of the festival, as well as some courses incorporating the festival programs into the coursework that students were required to complete. Um, the 14 feature films you can see listed here um, and there were also 20 short films, um, some of which were screened in Tucker Theater. The major films from this year's festival are shown here, Parasite and Portrait of a Lady on Fire. We were pleased to have because these films had not yet been screened in the Williamsburg area. And to switch it up a bit in the 2020 year, we had Devochka do the silent film program, which has become a tradition of the festival. Looking ahead to 2021, we will have the festival March 25th to the 28th. And given that it will be later in the spring, this will enable us to have outdoor screenings um, because the festival will take on a hybrid in-person virtual approach given COVID-19 considerations. So in-person events will be held outdoors and we are exploring the possibility of some of those being a drive-in screening. Um, so we are happy to take any questions about the festival before moving on to the adventure race. Why don't we go ahead and do the adventure race and then we'll, we'll come back to the council for any questions and comments. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. So the adventure race, it was the sixth annual Great Williamsburg Adventure Race. This year took place October 22 to 25. As in years past, the core of this event involved teams running around the city of Williamsburg, completing small tasks and challenges and activities related to Williamsburg businesses, uh, kind of inspired by the TV show, The Amazing Race. You can see some examples of 
uh, past pre-COVID activity times uh, in this poster here. Uh, given COVID, we radically switched up the format for this year's race. Instead of being a one afternoon thing that took place for three hours in one day, it was an untimed event that people did on their own time over the course of four days. This allowed us to really mix things up in regards to how the actual race was run. So instead of just having people within a radius of the downtown area where they could get to reasonably on foot during a couple of hours, they were able to go throughout the entire limits of the city of Williamsburg, expected to use cars, bikes, or public transportation to complete the race. Teams were limited to two players. It's kind of the smallest we've ever had, down from four. Uh, and we really encourage people to play with someone in their COVID bubble someone they lived with, or in the case of Wayne and Mary students, their roommates. And then there were also standard COVID precautions at all challenge sites and teams and facilitators wore masks throughout the duration of the race. Wayne and Mary students were able to participate free again this year, uh, courtesy of the city's sponsorship. And non-student teams were able to participate as well through purchasing a ticket. We had 69 pre-registered teams, 47 of which were William & Mary student teams and 22 community teams. We partnered again with William & Mary, the Office of First Year Experience and Student Leadership Development, as well as Student Assembly to help get the word out across campus um, using their calendars, print, video, calendar, promotional materials, any channels on campus we could get the word out. Uh, we helped make sure people were aware of the events. Uh, here's a bunch of logos of businesses that participated with physical in-person challenges. Uh, some of them might stand out like current Midtown Apartments was kind of neat that's under construction, but students and teammates are able to rush through a, uh, a mock apartment doing a mini scavenger hunt for that challenge site. Or you'll see places like Work Nimbly and Backyard Burger Seed and Supply that would normally be too far off the beaten path for attendees to reach on foot during one afternoon, but because of the new format, uh, teams had to travel there, find out how to get there, and then meet the people at the, at the businesses, which was really kind of an exciting change for this year. Um, also, because of that, speaking of sending people all over the city, we were able to send them to city parks. Uh, the race has challenges, but also has puzzles and riddles that must be completed. And this year's puzzles and riddles focused on the locations listed here. So we very much send people to check out art installations, hiking trails, athletic facilities, playgrounds, and had them running all over the entire city of Williamsburg to complete uh, the different puzzles. So it was a really neat, different way to show, uh, especially introducing to students, like, hey, here's all the facilities and parks throughout the city of Williamsburg, um, or not all of them, but a, a good helping of them uh, to kind of get a lay of the land and see what those spaces are like. And building on that, uh, one of the art installations featured was the Art Town 2020 24 7 Community Art Project. Um, you can see some of the screenshots from the puzzle reveal show that was held after the race was completed, where we explained the answers to all the puzzles to the participants in a video. The awards ceremony was also held virtually and we had 18 teams obtain a perfect score. So the grand prize winner was selected via a raffle and we had city council support in drawing the winner for that raffle prize. Um, the prize pack was made up of donations from various uh, race sponsors. Um, some businesses uh, sponsored by both doing a challenge and donating a prize and some participated by donating a prize and you can see those businesses here. We also had a special challenge this year given the new nature of the event and that was a photo challenge. Um, all activities were optional and so if teams were unable to complete any activities for any reason, they still had an opportunity to win a prize by completing the photo challenges. And you can see the photo challenge winners here. Uh, looking ahead, we've really enjoyed doing the race in partnership with the city and the support that comes with that and would hope to do so again in the future. Obviously, we don't know what 2021 looks like. 
Uh, but in the event there wasn't a race again in 2021, we would hope to not only continue our support with the city, uh, but continue that partnership with Wayman Mary uh, through the Wayman Mary Student Leadership Development and the Office of First Year Experience. Having the direct communications come out from student government and student assembly this year was uh, a new thing and really great in addition to the advertising campaign that Liz talked about earlier. And then it was also really great to see the energy and enthusiasm from the businesses beyond the area which we would usually hold the race in on foot and hope to continue to engaging those businesses uh, throughout the entirety of the city of Williamsburg moving forward. So given that, uh, we will now, we're now happy to answer your questions on either of these events. Um, Thank you, yeah. Liz. Thank you, Adam. Uh, you know, it seems a, a positive unintended consequence of the, for the greater venture race um, and the COVID effect was that people, participants were able to get out further in the city. And I think the, um, that was probably a good thing. So we certainly hope that um, we'll see something in 2021. But as you said, who knows what's what's in store for us? Um, Vice Mayor Dent, any questions or comments? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Liz and Adam, for the update and for all of your work on these projects. Um, I think it's really important that um, you know these projects. Obviously, the Global Film Festival occurred before the pandemic, but that you were able to um, change the format of the Great Adventure Race, and I really think it gave people an outlet during the pandemic. A, a safe outlet where um, they could remain healthy but still participate in the race. Um, there was a lot of encouraging numbers in there too that jumped out to me were um, the number, I think it was 34 uh, percent of the tickets were purchased outside the area, which is which is exciting. And, and also that the number of first time attendees for the Global Film Festival. So it, it's obviously um, the marketing's working, but it, the the nature of the event, the word starting to spread, which is hopefully going to continue to increase the attendance. And that you're already, even though we don't know where we'll be in 2021, that you're already planning for um, this global film festival in 2021, and maybe it has some changes. Um, and then uh, again, for the for the great adventure race, um, it, it could have been easily like a, other, a lot of other events and canceled. Um, but, you know, thanks to your work of uh, formatting it, the reformat of the race that people were able to participate in. Again, I think probably um, it probably provided them some some mental health outlet um, during this pandemic. So we really appreciate all you've done and look forward to the races continuing. And hopefully um, the pandemic will be coming to a close and and things can get back to normal. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Ramsey. Oh, me next or Ted. So oh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean, didn't mean to skip you, Ted, but uh, since you got the floor, Barbara. Uh, well, I'll just say, I think everyone knows that I'm a, a huge proponent of the Global Film Festival. And I think one thing that stands out, particularly in 2020, was the caliber of the films that you all were able to, to snare and to, to present. I saw seven of the, the films and they were all spectacular and three of them have ended up on top film list. Uh, obviously, Parasite won the Oscar for, for as a surprise contender for, for best picture, but then Knives Out was a very popular film and then Back Around has come up on list of one of the best films for 2020. And those that I didn't, and the Devochka silent film was just amazing, the music with, with the film. So um, so I'm very excited to see that the numbers are, are really inching up. I'm very pleased that all of the alumni continue to come back because I think that is a, a great way, not only of developing greater depth for the film festival, but to get that word of mouth out and, and to really step it up to the next notch because we're very fortunate to have a lot of William & Mary alums who are in the film business uh, across all different categories. The only question I had was, you mentioned that there were 48% uh, of those who responded to the survey were first first timers. Do you know whether those were students because Obviously, you know, freshmen wouldn't have had an opportunity to come before, or, or do you have any data on that? Uh, none of those were students. 
because uh, students receive tickets for free um, through other means. So they had to go and do a separate booking process. And unless Liz, am I wrong on this? You're correct. So yeah. the survey was only sent to people who purchased their ticket online um, because okay. we had their email address. Yes. Yeah. Well, I may have missed that. But anyway, I think that's great. And also the, um, the continuation of more overnight visitation, because that's, that's one thing we're looking for is that overnight visitation, particularly in sort of the off season. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited uh, about you all taking the helm and going forward for 2021. Can't wait to see what you'll have. Of course, all of the films this year are streamed, so who knows? <laughs> and, um, and then for the adventure race, I too think it was really great that you expanded it because part of the goal is for students to and newcomers to get to know the area. And so this way they can get to know more than just the downtown area. Um, I know in past years, we've had some repeat teams um, participate. Did you see that this year or were they mostly first timers? That's a good question. I think um, just this is kind of based off uh, observations alone. We don't have an exit survey for who was repeat on this, but I think we had more repeats year to year prior to this and there were more new faces, especially new students this year. Okay. And if I had to take a guess on that, I would attribute it to just general COVID kind of awareness and safety. And even though it was a very COVID safe event, I think just event attendance in general for something in late October, um, there's kind of a different bar for every everyone who may get involved. So I, I really wonder what our numbers would have been like had it not been a unique, I mean, th there's a lot of like what ifs, but I think we had a lot of new people compared to repeaters as, a pair, as compared to previous years, if that makes sense. Um, and I assume it has something to do with the COVID and the four day format. Yeah, and like the uh, vice mayor said, I think it was a lot of people were, were glad to have an event that they could participate in safely and just sort of get, get out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you mentioned that they traveled to the off sites. Do you know what types of transportation were primarily used? Mm. Um, I know we're, we always try to encourage students to use public transportation and and just sort of curious whether particularly the first year ones took advantage of that. Um, we don't have, again, an exit survey, but we do know that the, some students did take public transportation and there's some students who did the whole things on bikes and there's one team that did the entire race on foot, which kind of blew my mind a little bit. Um, because people were going a bit more leisurely, we also got reports of people saying, hey, this I ended up instead of engaging with this for two and a half to three hours, this was a six to eight hour activity. And I loved it for that. So people would either make like a full Saturday of it or they would chunk it out a little bit uh, over the course of multiple days. So there was a lot more just engagement and a lot more when you're running around anyone who's seen the past race, you run into a business, you're like, tell me what to do. And you have a good positive interaction with that business, but you're also on the clock trying to Get everything done in this case and there might be other teams coming and going standing in line a lot more frantic this year i i didn't hear a single report of there being more than one team at a physical location at a time so unless they were partnered up with another team and doing like a, a two-pair combo intentionally um, so they would go to a location and have a long meaningful interaction with that business and in more of a conversation and like the business could handle more promotion and whatnot so i think that i'm getting, getting a bit away from the original end of your question but um, the idea is I think we had a different level of engagement in that regard. Good. And I think the, the higher the engagement and interaction, the more likely, particularly the students will be to return to, to that business in the future. Yeah. So. Yeah, there were some really good promos that we're encouraged the businesses to hand out their own promotional things at each stop. And I know like nine round gave a couple weeks or a month of free workouts to a lot of people and you know midtown did goodie bags that every student got that had things inside it and other places did coupons so they come away with all kinds of swag which for the students is a really neat experience to hey i'm learning how to use public transportation i'm discovering these parks i didn't know were there they had to hike the entirety of the tunnel trail to like do a couple of puzzles and so they, they're discovering things they didn't know were here um and i think they they have a positive experience for it thank you thank you Okay, Mr. Maslin, I'm sorry I, I skipped you there, but the floor's yeah, yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, 
for the uh, the film. Uh, yeah, thanks for the metrics, especially the uh, out of town visitors and uh, being able to document hotel and restaurant statistics. That's really great to have that this year. Uh, we've talked about this in the past uh, opportunities for highlighting film locations uh, within Williamsburg for location scouts. Were you able to make any headway there? Well, as we mentioned, this was our first year partnering with the Virginia Film Office, um, having them as a sponsor. And so we look forward to building that partnership with them moving forward and exploring new opportunities such as um, advertising to location scouts. And then for the uh, Great Adventure race, uh, yeah, I agree with you on the pacing was good. I was over at the uh, police uh, station for a while where they were doing the um, walking under influence challenge. <laughs> and we didn't see the backup lines that we did before. And I think that that worked out really well. Um, the uh, Any feedback from the, ho you know, the host challenge businesses and, and agencies? Yeah, we had a lot of positive feedback. We go around and we touch base in person with those businesses several times before and then after the race, say, how did it all go? What would you change? What would you do? Um, and for repeat customers for them, this is kind of like teams who have, or businesses who have done it before, this is, they've tried to make it kind of a no brainer thing they do every year. And we make sure they mix it up so everybody gets a fresh experience when they come in their place. But they're always like, yep, it's great. We've really streamlined it, we got it down. And then the new businesses, it's really fun to go and see their debrief and they're already like, well, next time I want to do this challenge. I was thinking about it and I met them and here are the photos. Um, but overall, we've gotten really great host feedback from, from everyone who hosted a challenge, all those businesses. Um, That's great. And then uh, I liked your uh, introducing the parks. Uh, for next year, do you think we can add some more heritage locations? Uh, I mean, everything's on the table within the city of Williamsburg. So in particular, if there's certain sites around the city that you all think teams would be really great to check out. We're happy to include those. That'd be great. Thanks. Mr. Rogers. Thank you so much, Adam and Liz, for all of the, the projects that you're bringing to Williamsburg. I think these two, uh, despite their being in completely different worlds, it feels like one in February, one in October, uh, were both really successful. Both had a lot of people getting engaged and especially for the Great Adventure Race. I think really you all pivoted so well to still allow people to get out in the community to see new sites, but to also do so uh, distance. So thank you very much for all of the hard work. I, I'm sure growing the film festival and figuring out what the heck to do with the Great Adventure Race um, is a difficult challenge. And I appreciate all the time that you all put into it. I've got a couple of questions on both. I'll start with the film festival. I was really surprised as well that 34% of the almost 3,000 visitors had come from out of state. That is uh, really encouraging for the type of quality that I think people are expecting from the, the film festival. And, and I was wondering if you've seen those numbers grow over the years as word is spread about the festival. Yes, we have seen them grow. And um, just a quick clarification about that statistic. It was 34% of the online ticket purchases okay. um, because we're only able to track the location of those um, purchases. Otherwise, the tickets were purchased at the Kimball box office. Um, but we have seen a steady increase in the attendees from outside the Williamsburg area um, since 2017 when we started producing the festival. And that is one of the main focuses of the festival is continuing to grow engagement outside of just the Williamsburg community. Well, I think Councilwoman Ramsey had a great point. Uh, and thank you, of course, Barb, for all your support to the festival, is that the, the big name picture, the motion, motion pictures that you all get, I think provide a lot of that allure for people coming to see Parasite or Knives Out. But I also particularly loved, as I know a lot of people did, the individual breakout sessions that you can have. And I, I really vividly remember one with one Virginia 2021 about redistricting in the state. And I remember uh, the, the presentation for it in which their director was talking about wildly redistrict maps and said that one was called by a judge looking like a dead pterodactyl lying on the state of Maryland. So that has really stuck in my mind. I think the rest of the, the breakout sessions were equally as engaging and it had been really neat recently to see that actual uh, 
the one Virginia 2021 referendum have success at the ballot. So that was that was incredibly done uh, with all of the both big name pictures that you all have, but then of course the breakout sessions from people involved with those films too. Liz, you had mentioned the potential for drive-in films this year. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I know the planning is probably still going on, but I'm curious to know generally how it may look uh, still with the, the distancing necessary. Sure, yes, it's a possibility we're still exploring. So right now plans are very fluid. Um, it's something that we've seen other festivals do this year to maintain an in-person element. And so again, it's finding a place where people will still be able to stay in their cars and allow them together safely. Um, so we're looking at other venues nearby where we would have a large enough area for a decent number of cars together and set up an outdoor screen. Um, we've worked with a few different vendors in the past that have the type of equipment that would enable us to still have a quality projection screen set up. Um, so we feel like it is a viable possibility. There's just a little bit more lab work to happen for it to become a reality. Well, you all may have already considered it, but one of the potential locations would be the Palace Farm destination of Colonial Williamsburg, which had been rezoned a couple of years ago for allowing for a bit more uh, louder and boisterous events rather than just the museum support district it had been in. So there could be potential as it is a larger field right now. And they were thinking of concerts to have that be maybe one of the spots for drive-in theater. Uh, mm -hmm. And on the great adventure race, uh, also, like I was saying, equally as fun, despite all the difference of this year, I was wondering if uh, as the word has grown about the race, you've seen more businesses want to get involved and become one of the stops or one of the sponsors. I know Danforth Pewter and Ely and Orange Theory are, are regularly involved. And I was curious if you've seen more want to get involved, recognizing that it's a great way to grow their customer base. Yeah, we've seen over the years um, more word of mouth between businesses. For example, like um, Revolution Golf and Grill, you mentioned, have been involved a long time. And so Orange Theory heard, like, they're buddies with the Orange Theory folks. And, and that's how that came. And Paint on Pottery had seen them the previous year. And it was like, what was that? And Movie Tavern kind of got looped in that way. So it's a little bit more of like, I saw that thing. What was it? Oh, I, I would like in. Um, but there's not a, in so much as we don't get businesses who see it in the news and then contact us and go, how can I get in on this? We do really thorough outreach to every business within the city of Williamsburg. So this year working with the economic development office, we sent a paper postcard and email to every uh, business in the city that had either a brick and mortar address or was an independent contractor that worked from home because they could also set up remotely and team with another place. So we quite a few hundreds and hundreds hundreds of contacts go out there. Um, this year, the reception was interesting. We ended up having the same amount of challenge stations as usual, but I think because of COVID and because where everybody's standing logistically and financially, we ended up kind of with the same number um, with some new faces in the mix. Sure. So, and, I, and I imagine when things return to normalcy, you'll have plenty uh, per word of mouth or per seeing some press coverage about it, want to get involved. So again, Adam and Liz, thank you very much for all, all the time you've put in to finding ways for people getting more involved in Williamsburg. I so appreciate it. Those are all the questions I have. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, you know, Adam and Liz, sounds like we had a, a good year, despite it was certainly with the adventure race, some uh, unforeseen challenges with COVID, but the, the brand seems to be alive and, and people enjoyed it. Businesses enjoyed it. And, and I think, um, you all did well to, to stage the city in a way that helped showcase all of the different uh, or a lot of the different things that we have to offer here. And so we look forward to you guys continuing next year. Um, you know, I know that you guys think out of the box routinely, so I'm sure you'll be doing that um, as we try to figure out where we are next spring um, uh, so that we can have a successful program, however that looks. So, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming in today and, and sharing the results with us. Sure thing. Thanks for all the continued support. It's really fantastic. Okay. We'll see you all later. All right, okay. So next, you. we have uh, a presentation of the Neighborhood Balance Committee uh, report. Mr. Trivet. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Uh, before we dig into this, I do want to make just one housekeeping announcement. Um, we had some reports come in that people were struggling with the audio on the city's YouTube channel. And I uh, just want to confirm that the audio on the YouTube channel is malfunctioning, um, but you can watch the meeting with audio on Facebook uh, as well as on channel 48. And after the meeting today, we will upload a new version of the meeting to YouTube so that folks that missed it can watch it there. Thank you. All right, so for our neighborhood balance presentation, Um, for those of you who have had the chance to see this uh, on the city's website in terms of um, it being posted there in its entirety, we're not going to go through all of the slides. I know that will be a relief, um, but we are going to try to, to skim through most of it just to give some background on the work that the Neighborhood Balance Committee has done over the last year. Uh, so we'll start with the timeline. Um, the committee has been meeting, as I said, over the last year. Uh, we started in September of last year. Of course, we were delayed a little bit by COVID-19 before we could pick it up and finish the work. And so far, we have had a total of eight meetings um, to bring us to this point. And so the timeline that I'm showing you here sort of runs through the breakdown of each one of those eight meetings, uh, what was covered, and uh, sort of brings you current to where we are today with our presentation of the recommendations to the city council. So just to try and bring you up to speed on what we did um, at each one of these meetings, uh, I'll, just, I'll try to go through them quickly. At meeting one, we really just tried to set the tone for what we were gonna be doing. So Carolyn Murphy, our planning director, gave a, a really in-depth look at some of the basic building blocks of what drives neighborhood balance in the city of Williamsburg. And so we talked about occupancy limits, we talked about rental inspections, and we talked about rental conversions and gave some good statistics on what we were seeing in the neighborhoods currently. So then at may, meeting number two, we started looking at some of the materials from uh, around uh, the country that talk about the same issue. And we spent a lot of time in the Neighborhood Balance Committee looking at this policy document that was put out by the city of Boston uh, for their 2030 vision. It's called Housing a Changing City. And it looks at housing issues in the metro area of Boston, which at first glance, people might say, well, that's not really relevant. Williamsburg is not Boston. We're never going to be Boston. And that's true. But when you really break down some of the challenges of the housing market in Boston, you see the similarities to Williamsburg. Um, and so it did end up being a pretty good model for us in terms of looking at what they were dealing with and what they had decided to do to try and combat it. And so uh, at this first meeting, we looked at chapter number five, um, which sort of looked at uh, the graduate housing and, and student housing issue in depth. Um, and, you know, this quote that I've got here on the left hand of the screen, I, I thought was interesting because this this whole uh, scope of, of conversation was about um, the students and how they were impacting affordability of housing in Metro Boston. And there was an article in the, the Boston Globe, I believe it was, where Emma Goodwin, a, a student, Emerson, said, no, wait a minute, the students need affordable housing too. And so it was a good context to try and remind everybody that we're looking at this, not just from one angle, but from a lot of them. So then at, at meeting number two, we had a guest speaker um, who came in, Dr. Jeffrey Klee, came in and talked to us about uh, the importance of preservation, gave us a good example from the city of Boston of a, a house that was being torn down. The city stepped in and stopped it. And as you can see there, the outcome is on the right. Um, not a great reproduction of what was there, so a lot was lost due to that uh, partial demolition, um, but certainly some of the character remained. So then at meeting number three, we talked about an APA or planning document guidance that had just come out, um, number 10 for the year on zoning practice. And it highlighted some ways in which cities across the country were using zoning to combat housing issues. And particularly this was looking at the issues that dealt with sort of um, rental properties that are neglected and the concept of nuisance ordinances that deal with that um, and as you can see there in the bottom left hand corner, there's a chart that shows you where Virginia is on the spectrum of rental regulations, sort of right in the middle. 
We're not allowed to do a lot of the more heavy handed uh, regulations for rental properties based on the, the code of Virginia currently, uh, but we do have some ability to regulate what happens uh, via our own rental inspection process. So at meeting number three, our guest speaker was um, George Homewood from the city of Norfolk. And uh, he talked to us about what the city of Norfolk is doing relative to neighborhood balance and the issues that they face. Obviously the drivers there are some college students, but also um, employees and um, sailors in the Navy. And so a lot of their programs are geared toward those issues. The, the thing that we took away from Mr. Homewood's presentation that was particularly valuable was the concept that they use. It's called Rent Ready Norfolk. It's a voluntary rental certification program that really gives Norfolk a lot of the ability to regulate rental properties in the same way that those nuisance property ordinances do in other parts of the country. Um, so sort of an interesting solution to that problem. So at meeting number four, our guest speaker was Mr. Ikefuna from the city of Charlottesville. And he again talked about what the city of Charlottesville is doing in the realm of housing, particularly for students, but also affordable housing uh, in and around Charlottesville. Um, the takeaway from his conversation with us was the, this concept of a policy advisory committee that meets in the city of Charlottesville. It, it, it's comprised of both um, a higher level administrative body that includes the president of UVA, the mayor, um, and some of the board of supervisors from Albemarle County. But underneath that, is the uh, policy advisory committee, technical advisory committee. And that's sort of the, the next chain of command, which is the planning directors from both the university, the county and the city, all meeting to talk about how their various plans are coming together as well as development proposals. And so the city of Williamsburg is currently already doing the policy advisory committee um, through our joint administrative meetings that we do monthly, which is more frequently than the city of Charlottesville does. Um, but we do not have the PAC-TAC uh, component of it. So then at meeting number five, we had Ann McClung from uh, the city of Blacksburg, or sorry, town of Blacksburg. And what we learned from her was that they are sort of in the midst of a similar process to what we're doing with Neighborhood Balance Committee. Uh, they have a program that's called Build Better Blacksburg where they're looking at a lot of new initiatives to deal with some of the same things that we were discussing. And so she sort of peeled back the envelope a little bit and let us in on some of the work that they were doing. Um, so some of these programs are things that they've not instituted yet. An example would be contingent interest mortgage program. And this is a process by which uh, there's a funding source that allows a property to be purchased by an employee of the university and then the payments back on the loan that was given are based on the assessed value of the property increasing or decreasing. Um, so sort of an interesting way to, to see that finance occur. Meeting number six, Ed LeClear uh, came to speak to us, and he is the planning director in State College Borough of Pennsylvania. This is where Penn State is located. Um, and it, they are really sort of at the forefront of regulating this issue. And I, I emphasize that term regulating because most of the solutions that he talked to us about were regulation based. Um, you know, carrots and sticks as opposed to uh, programs designed to buy down costs. Um, and he was very plain language with us about why that was. Most of the programs they had tried to buy down costs were unsuccessful or um, proved to be just entirely too expensive. And it was because most of the property that they're trying to deal with is very expensive. And so as they identified funding to buy down costs, it was quickly exhausted. Um, and so very little impact on the whole. One of the things he did talk to us about that we found quite interesting is they do have a nuisance property ordinance that allows them to regulate rental property. And it's a, a sort of a demerit based system where properties that are in a rental program are allowed to have so many points in a year where points equal some type of violation of an ordinance. And when they achieve the max cap, then their, their rental license is suspended. Um, so a, a pretty aggressive stance toward rental regulation. So then at meeting number seven, we talked a little bit more about affordability. 
um, finishing out the housing and changing city component, uh, chapter number three. And we looked at what the Williamsburg neighborhoods are in terms of affordability, sort of an interesting way to consider it. How many of our neighborhoods are affordable to which income brackets? And you can see that on the screen there. And then we had a guest speaker, uh, Chip Dix, who's an attorney uh, with Gentry Lock in Richmond, spoke to us about Virginia landlord tenant law and it sort of explained all of the regulations relative to uh, landlord tenant interaction that come out of the Virginia code. Um, interesting about this was his, his view of occupancy limits and how difficult they are to enforce because of the burden of proof on the locality to demonstrate that there is in fact a violation. And that's certainly something that we see here in the city of Williamsburg. And then we got our first look at the recommendations or concepts as we came to call them uh, that the neighborhood balance committee had talked and seen um, in the last seven meetings. And uh, we began to add to those from committee member suggestions. So then at meeting number eight, we've sort of dropped back and revisited what we talked about in meeting number one, because it had been almost a year since that first meeting. And so we went through and updated some of those basic building blocks that drive the issue of neighborhood balance in the city of Williamsburg. And so on these next slides, they're just updated information on the four person rentals that are allowed in the city, how many there are, who owns them and where they're located. On this slide, you can see sort of at the bottom left corner, we've got the, the neighborhood owner rental information. This shows you every year we do sort of a survey of rental properties in each neighborhood so that we can determine what percentage of the neighborhood has been converted to rental. Um, and then there's a, a average cost to housing in the various neighborhoods at the top. And then on the right is an, a, a review that was done by the city's assessor, Derek Green, to try and understand how the four person allowance is impacting affordability of the house itself. And so he did this study that looked at um, our assessed value, the current rent rates for those properties and um, the impact on sales prices. And he did not find a direct correlation. So that brings us to where we are tonight. Um, and that is the final number eight meeting of the Neighborhood Balance Committee. We presented the 27 concepts that resulted from this year long effort to the committee. And we talked about them at length based on their questions. And then what we did is we asked them to go and on their own time over a period of about 30 days, use an online program to vote for which of the concepts they liked the best. Now, the way that we did this is the, the program allowed them to rank the top 10 of the 27 concepts twice. The first time they ranked them based on short term application and the second time they ranked them based on long term application. Um, so what you end up with is a top 10 list that grow in importance as you approach number one. So this is the outcome of that effort for the short term results. And this can be a complicated graph, so I'm just gonna explain it. The green bars represent the percentage of the committee members who included that particular concept in their top 10, regardless of where it was in the ranking one through 10. The blue line represents the average ranking from those people who scored it in their top 10. So you've sort of got two pieces of data here. You've got the concepts that receive the most votes in the top 10 fashion, and then you've got the placement of those concepts in the ranking amongst those who voted. And so I think both are important to look at. Um, if you look at strictly the votes alone, obviously the, the trend is clear. The certified rental program would be number one. Instituting a trash cart ordinance would be number two. And then the annual town gown report would be three. Um, and then you sort of see that the, the voting profile in terms of rank followed that until you get a little further down the chart. And then you start to see things like the nuisance property ordinance that scored very high in rank, but did not get as many votes as well as things like the four person repeal who actually, which actually got the highest amount or the highest ranking 
of those that included it in their top 10. So what we thought we would do tonight um, to use our time wisely, and I, I should have said this at the beginning, but I just want to be clear. We're not asking the city council to take any action tonight. This is not the end of a journey. This is sort of the midpoint or the beginning of the, the next phase. Um, what we are hoping to achieve tonight is just to make the council aware of the work that the Neighborhood Balance Committee has done and um, begin the conversation at the council level as to what the next step needs to be. What the staff would like to do is get your all's feedback tonight on what you think of the outcome of this work, um, which of these concepts resonate the most with you, and that will inform a staff process over the next couple of months where we begin to build an implementation plan for action on this. Um, obviously, we have a very small planning staff that are currently fully engaged in completing the comprehensive plan update. So we can't bite off all 27 of these concepts at one time. We couldn't even bite off two or three of them at the same time. Um, so what we need to do is sit down and talk about where we can devote the resources to have some impact in the short term and in the long term and come back to council with that plan. Um, so we'll use your comments tonight as well as the voting to determine what those steps might be. Um, as we begin to put together our implementation plan, we will consider both the number of votes as well as the rank for the concepts in the voting process. So nothing will be left out um, and we will we'll come back with what we think is a, a full and complete plan for implementation of some of the top issues that were identified by the committee. So just to walk through a couple of them from the short term list, um, the top vote getter was the certified rental program. And it, just to boil this down into its simplest form, I told you that we heard from George Homeland at the city of Norfolk about the rent ready program that they use. And essentially what this would be is developing our own version of that program. Um, we would use this as a tool to apply uh, best practices to rental property and to help curb bad behavior at those rental properties, either by the landlord or by the renters, uh, so that they're good neighbors in the neighborhoods. Um, so I think that this is, a, this is an easy um, project for us to tackle in terms of what to do, because we can follow the model that's already been set, um, but it definitely gives us a very strong tool in the toolbox to try and address some of the issues that come up during the year from rental property. Next is instituting a trash card ordinance. This is something that we had talked about probably three or four years ago now. Um, and this is, again, a fairly simple concept of instituting an ordinance that requires residents to bring their trash carts back from the curb after trash day. Um, the key component of an ordinance like this is the penalty. Uh, without the penalty, then the ordinance really doesn't mean much. And we get back to where we were probably four years ago, where much of our staff was spending a lot of time actually themselves dragging trash carts back from the curb. Um, and that's something that we want to not do. Um, so we really need to get the residents that are, that are um, leaving their carts at the curb to comply. And the ordinance is probably the best tool to do that. An annual town gown report. Now this was interesting because this is not something that we do. Um, I don't know that it would have occurred to us to do it. Um, we certainly spend a lot of time talking informally about town gown issues as they arise and as we address them, but there's no process by which the, the city and the, the university come to city council or to the board of trustees and make a report on what's happened this year, what progress was made, what were the issues and how do we deal with them. Um, it was a common theme amongst all of our presenters from planning directors at other university towns that this is something that they do and felt like it really helped to clarify what the issues were for the elected officials, but also the residents. Um, so this is another one that would not be incredibly difficult for us to implement. Adopt a Cop Academy. Um, so we have done a lot in the realm of community policing, and this would be one more step in that. Um, our police chief, since he's come here, has really done a lot to make this police department much more accessible outside of those experiences that involve a traffic ticket or, or some type of citation. Um, and so he already has a very strong partnership with the university police department. 
Um, but it's one that I think we can strengthen by looking at what the town of Blacksburg does with their Adopt-A-Cop Academy, which is really dedicated to the Greek Life Program. Um, I know that uh, Chief Dunn speaks to the, the Greek Life Society at William Mary at least once a year, maybe more than that. Um, but I think we can look at ways to incorporate some components of what's happening in the town of Blacksburg at Virginia Tech here with Williamsburg and William & Mary. A nuisance property ordinance. Um, so this is the example that we saw from uh, Penn State. And right now, this is something that we are not empowered to do by the Code of Virginia. So this is one of those items that would take considerable effort as we lobbied for change in the Virginia Code that would give us that ability. Um, I don't know that it's outside the realm of possibility. The city of Williamsburg pioneered the rental inspection process uh, back when it was adopted into the Virginia Code, and this sort of seems like the natural evolution of that process. Um, but make no mistake, there will be those that oppose it uh, because it's obviously a, a step of control exercised by the government over something right now that is sort of open to free enterprise. Um, so this is a, a more of a long-term solution than short-term, just in terms of how we look at how long it's going to take us to accomplish something. Um, at the bottom of each one of these concepts, you'll see the staff and I took our best guess for how long it might take to implement, but also how long it might take for us to see impact after it was implemented. Um, and we did that just so that people could have measured expectations as to what would happen once the city did or did not take action. So then that brings us to the long-term results. As I said before, the committee was asked to score each one of these concepts twice. Um, the first time short-term, which we've talked about, and now long-term. Um, so this chart operates in the same way. The green bars represent the number of votes that were received for that concept on the whole in the top 10, regardless of ranking. And the blue line represents the average ranking for those people that included that concept in their top 10. Um, so this one follows a similar trend. The first item uh, on the list is the community land trust. It, it not only got a lot of votes, but it scored very high. And then down toward the end or the, the middle part of the chart, you can see housing needs analysis is one that did not get a lot of votes, but for those who voted for it, they felt strongly it would have a significant impact and ranked it very high on their list. So community land trust, this was an interesting idea uh, that was brought to us by, um, again, State College Borough in Pennsylvania. And what this basically is, is the community land trust is formed, a source of funding is dedicated, and then the land trust uses that funding to buy the land underneath the rental property um, and then sells the house itself or leases the house itself, um, which basically cuts the cost down because you're subtracting the value of the land. It also gives considerable control over what happens at that property to the locality or to the trust who owns the land underneath it. Um, so definitely a lot of control can be exercised over what happens in terms of whether that's a leased property, whether it's a, a traditional rental, or whether it is owner-occupied um, by somebody in the home. So sort of an interesting concept, but again, not one that would come without considerable cost. Preservation Assistance Program. This is something we spent a little bit of time talking about at the committee. Uh, there, there is certainly a cost to the ARB requirements for properties that are in an ARB district. Um, if you buy a home in that district, you may be required to, to replace windows when you replace them um, with a certain type or use uh, certain colors of paint, um, certain materials that may cost more. Um, and obviously that cost drives up the overall cost of the property. And so the thought was that that may actually contribute to the lack of affordability in some of these neighborhoods. And so the thought was, if there was a preservation assistance program, a source of funding, either a grant or a loan, that could help new buyers, new homeowners, buy down the cost of improvement by taking out that higher material value imposed by the ARB, it would make the properties more accessible to a larger group of people. Um, again, this is another one that requires probably some, some significant funding. Um, and it, you can see that in the implementation and impact at the bottom of the slides, we've included the amount of time required 
And that's reflective of the fact that we have to identify a funding source. So while it may not be hard to develop a grant program in terms of a policy, it may be very challenging to find a renewable funding source that would allow this to have any type of real impact. Same thing for direct loan program. Um, so this is the idea of having a loan program that would help uh, offer a lower interest rate than you might get absent public participation um, and more favorable terms. Uh, so this is similar to a first-time home buyers type assistance, uh, only it would be internal financing. Um, I think that we could look at this and, and talk with local lenders about how to set up a program where we reduce the cost of this program by looking at shared rates, uh, blended rates, uh, they're more, most often called, where we offer uh, or someone offers a component of the loan at a lower interest rate to the higher interest rate that might be offered by the private sector. And then there's a blended overall rate that becomes the mortgage on the property. Um, so I think that this could be an answer to some part of the problem. But again, funding will be the challenge. Inclusionary zoning. Um, so this is something that we've talked about with the city council. The, the planning commission has talked about it relative to the comprehensive plan. And the neighborhood balance committee talked about it certainly relative to affordability. Inclusionary zoning is the process of requiring a number of units in a new residential development to be income restricted in some fashion. And so you would basically adopt an ordinance that requires some percentage of new units to be income restricted, and you'd have to define what that income restriction is. Um, so obviously this is a great tool for dealing with the amount of affordable housing. There is some question out there right now as to the true impact of inclusionary zoning ordinances. There's been some research done here in Virginia, in fact, Northern Virginia, um, as to does inclusionary zoning policies in their traditional sense drive up the overall cost of housing as the cost of the restricted units is built into the cost of the market rate units. Um, no conclusive answer there. It's just a question that, that has to be posed. Um, but so far, inclusionary zoning absolutely creates more affordable housing units in a community. The trouble Williamsburg will have in implementing this is the space to build these units. Um, so we're going to have to be a little bit creative in terms of what we allow, what we accept. Um, certainly, there are models out there where um, you can take payments in lieu which would fund some of the other programs that we've talked about, particularly uh, the loans or the preservation assistance programs, um, but also allowing the affordable units that you're requiring to be built in the neighboring jurisdictions where there might be some property for that. Um, so I think we can be creative and find a solution. Hotel to affordable housing conversion. This is something that we have done um, for some time. The number of units the city council had dedicated to this purpose has nearly been exhausted. Um, so if we wanted to continue this process, we would need to talk about increasing the allowed units or changing that ordinance in some way. Um, I think this has been very successful in terms of converting uh, older hotel stock that's not performing well in the hotel market into useful affordable housing units. Um, I think where we have lacked in the implementation of this is, again, having a defined standard for what affordable is in Williamsburg. And so I think we can tweak this ordinance if we decide to move ahead with it to make it more effective. Um, but again, this is another one that the committee felt like needed a revisit. So then on this slide, the committee was not asked to vote or rank anything relative to specifically affordable housing concepts. But I thought it might be helpful for the council if I went through the voting results and pulled out the concepts that did have an affordable housing component to them and just showed you how they scored against each other. So again, this shows you the same thing. Um, in the affordable housing concept category, how many got the most votes, which would be the bars, and then the, of those votes, how are they ranked? Um, so that you can sort of see how the committee felt about importance. Again, they did not rank just based on the concept of affordable housing. This data is taken from the votes that were that were done primarily on the long term side of the two votes that the committee cast. Community land trust we've talked about. 
a housing needs analysis. Uh, one of the things that we identified as the committee moved through its work was that we've done some housing study, but we've not done a real in-depth needs analysis where the study comes back and says, based on the, the demographics and the, the growth trends, you need X number of units. And as we heard from outside planning directors, what we heard most often was that they did have that number. They knew they needed another 2,800 affordable units by the year 2030. And that's not a number that we could easily point to. Um, so there could be some work done there to help us identify what the target needs to be. Direct loan program we've discussed, inclusionary zoning we have discussed, hotel to affordable housing conversion. And those are the recommendations of the Neighborhood Balance Committee. Happy to take any questions. We did encourage um, our committee members to join us tonight when we thought this meeting would be in person. Um, I felt like it would be important for, for you to hear from committee members directly. Um, fortunately, we did have a couple send in some comments. You heard those from Sandy at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I know because we've, we've seen some emails from the committee that they are at home watching on Facebook. Um, and I'm sure that they will be glad to participate in conversations with you one on one or our future meetings of the city council that hopefully will be in person to allow that to happen more easily. We did send them the call in information as well as the ability to send in written comments. Um, so uh, hopefully if there are folks interested in talking to you tonight, they can uh, reach us by the phone. Well, that certainly is a, a lot to chew on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Trivett. Uh, it strikes me that, um, you know, I'm thinking back to the, the conversation we had during the three-person rule and the amount of meetings and uh, discussions and speakers that we had, and, and certainly um, what the Neighborhood Balance Committee has done rivals that effort. And I think we're ultimately going to end up in a good good place. Um, you know, there, there's a lot here that um, I certainly can can get behind. I think the rental certification program in conjunction with the college um, would probably be very successful. Um, you know, trash. You know, the trash card ordinance. I think I think it's time. You know, we initially avoided that um, early on because we went from backyard pickup to carts and we didn't want to put too much of a burden on our residents all at once. But I think we've, we've certainly have had enough time to, um, you know, get used to it and understand the value of having those returned to the back um, or out of sight, whether it's in the backyard, side yard, or wherever it needs to go. Um, and as you pointed out, a lot of these things are, are, are fairly easy to do. You know, the annual town gown, adopt a cop, um, so, you know, I look forward to seeing what council or what city staff can come back with in terms of, you know, some sort of implement implementation plan. Um, you know, the, the other side of that are some of the things that we have been talking about for, for years, um, you know, direct loan programs and inclusionary zoning, preservation assistance programs. Um, you know, there may be ways to find philanthropic residents who, who want to help preserve um, you know, some of these critical homes in, in the uh, districts around the historic area, particularly in the ARB zones, uh, so that they are maintained. And so there may be a source of funds out there, but funding is going to be the issue for a lot of these programs. And, um, you know, and that really is usually the toughest part of, of achieving these things is finding the money. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Vice Mayor Dent. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Mr. Trivet, uh, thanks to you and all of the committee. There's a tremendous amount of work that went into this. And as the mayor mentioned, there's a tremendous amount of information to, um, I know I've been through the presentation numerous times and it, it's still quite a bit of information to report, but there are things that uh, jump out that I think are, as the mayor mentioned, could be accomplished easily and would have a significant impact. Um, one of the things, could you just, could you, for people that are listening and may not be aware, could you just talk a little bit about how the committee was formed from the beginning? Sure, absolutely. So um, in 2019, 2020, GIO set dealing with owner occupancy was a theme at the city council's retreat. 
And so when we put together that GIO set, we included an item to form this neighborhood balance committee to look at the issue of the balance between renters and uh, owner occupied housing in the neighborhoods in, in Williamsburg. And so that became a city managers committee and the staff and I identified some residents as well as landlords and students and uh, administrators at William and Mary and of course the city staff um, and, and a facilitator who was, uh, represents the, the Realtors Association to help us navigate the discussion. Um, so we sent out invitations and from that had a group of people that agreed to serve, attended most of the meetings and then went through the process of voting. Um, and again, you know, when we started the journey, had some suspicion about what the ideas might be that came out of that conversation. But I really think the process of looking at what Boston had done, um, hearing from the planning director from just in the state, but out of the state and, and what they are doing in, in their communities, which I personally consider to be about 10 years ahead of Williamsburg in their housing challenge. So we get to learn from what they did right and what they did wrong to really be invaluable and produced when Carolyn and I sit down, sat down to identify what the concepts were. I was pretty surprised. I think she was too, at how many there were. I mean, we just, we had 21 without really trying hard in terms of digging through the material that we had heard. Um, so I think the end result was a, a really great list of ideas. And ultimately, I think that the voting process allowed the committee to express their desire for what they thought was most appropriate. Thanks. And, and um, did, I just want to make sure I was clear earlier, you said regardless of, of the rank in their 10 or, or how, how they ranked it, even though it was lower on the initial bar scale, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no further conversation on those issues. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. I mean, what, what we're going to do, Ms. Murphy and I, we're going to sit down and come up with an implementation plan um, that will be sort of the staff recommendation. And it's going to rely heavily on the voting process, but it's going to look at both categories of the vote. How were things ranked as well as how many votes did they get? That way, none of the good ideas will be left out of consideration. And of course, ultimately, just because they're the ones that we put forward to city council doesn't mean there can't be other ideas or items that didn't get ranked that the council thinks are worthy in that list of 27 potential strategies. Yeah, and certainly I think all the council looks forward to having those discussions on, on all of the topics, the concepts that were brought forward. And uh, can, was it uh, throughout, throughout the process, uh, uh, committee participation and and when it came to the voting, there was there was uh, adequate amount of participation from the committee. Oh, I think so. Yes. I mean, I think the committee uh, tolerated me assigning homework um, to most of the, the at most of the meetings. Um, and then not only did they do the homework, but they came prepared to sort of discuss what they had read. Um, and then when it came time for the vote, I can tell you the committee felt very, felt very passionately <laughs> about the concepts. Um, and had a great internal debate as to what should be done. There were emails back and forth uh, encouraging votes for one thing or another. Um, you know, I think that, I think there were a lot of good concepts on the list. I know the committee spent a lot of time talking about the four person allowance and its impact. Um, and that's why there were two concepts included that dealt with for, for, four person allowance, one being a repeal of that process entirely and another one being a moratorium. Um, and, you know, while the staff, I, I don't think, considers a, a repeal a good strategy, certainly a moratorium might be a way for us to um, take a minute and consider the impact on the housing market from new projects like Midtown Row, that we just aren't certain how that's going to impact the, the student housing uh, process in these historic neighborhoods. And I certainly didn't bring that topic up to question the the commitment from the participation on uh, from the committee members and their participation. It was actually to applaud it because um, it was impacted and got drawn out over a period of time. So it would be easy for committee members to lose focus and not, and not 
and not do the homework or not participate in the voting process um, because it, it, it got so drawn out. So again, that was just brought up to applaud their efforts. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, we had initially, we sent out, I think, 27 or so invitations um, and ended up with about 15 or 16 members on the committee that attended regularly um, over the period of a year with homework and some heavy lifting in terms of what to consider. And most of these meetings went two, two and a half hours, even three hours on occasion. Um, so I was quite impressed. And I, I told them this at the last meeting that as um, volunteers, they gave their time so willingly and really dedicated themselves to the topic. So, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed with this outcome. I think this is great information. Um, I, I'm really proud that the committee devoted themselves the way that they did. Yeah, and, and you know, I agree with the mayor and, and so, you know, the certified rental program and the trash ordinance, things that could have a, a significant impact with, with not a lot of effort, um, certainly behind those and look forward to further discussion on all the other concepts moving forward and look forward to whatever recommendation, discussing the recommendations that uh, staff brings back to us. That's before I kick it over to Mr. Maslin, I did want to speak to the four person rule. Um, you know, while it is controversial and some are, are strongly opposed to it, um, I don't know that it is the problem. Um, those houses typically um, aren't where we, we're seeing some of the, the negative effects um, in our neighborhoods. And so I, I'm not sure, I can tell you, I'm not supportive of repealing it. Um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to um, maybe establishing a moratorium until we get some further information, but repealing it, I, I don't think serves our interest. And we have to keep in mind that in order to, to be qualified for the four person rule, um, you, you submit yourself to uh, you know, extra oversight, um, annual inspections. Um, you have, you know, so there, there it's, it, it that oversight on those houses, I think, make um, them not the problem houses. So, um, um, so if we consider anything, it would be a moratorium for me. Mr. Maslin. Thanks. Uh, yeah, several observations. Uh, so two of the areas that we hope will be successful next year are the, you know, on-campus housing and Midtown Row apartments, as, uh, as Drew indicated. So William and Mary is financially motivated uh, to provide compelling reasons for upper class students to remain on campus. Um, and hopefully their inventory of on-campus housing will be increasing, especially as a lot of the renovations are completed. Uh, and I know they've got, even last week, they've got ongoing uh, strategy uh, meetings within the college to uh, talk about that. Uh, this morning I had the opportunity to talk to the leasing manager of Midtown Row and they're doing really well. Uh, they've already uh, uh, leased up about a third of the bedrooms. So, you know, their total is over six, the total capacity is over 600 bedrooms and they're already at about 200, which is great. Um, they've been focusing on the, uh, the juniors or the students that'll be juniors next year, obviously. Um, the, um, some of the successful strategies that they're implementing is uh, They've uh, increased their staffing with uh, William and Mary marketing interns who can really speak to the students. So that's that's really helping. Um, they're uh, bundling all the costs into one monthly rate, and, and we knew that before, uh, but they've just recently uh, added uh, electric charges into that. So electric charges will no longer be separate. So that really makes it, it convenient. Um, you know, it's, for parents who are looking at a budget, they know what they're going to be uh, paying, you know, for the, uh, the 11 and a half months there. Uh, also, another advantage uh, is because many of the juniors study abroad, there's now a provision that two students who study abroad where the plans are, are opposite semesters, they can actually transfer the lease from student to student. Uh, so that really helps in terms of, of flexibility. And then also for students on financial aid, they're making provisions for scheduled payments uh, that would be in line with uh, when that uh, financial aid is, is available. Uh, and so far, they've also seen some interest uh, 
expressed obviously from the School of Education, and I think that we'll see some partnering there, as well as actually some fraternity members. So, so that's good to hear that. Uh, and then I'd expect that the leasing activity for graduate students uh, will increase as uh, the graduate students make their decisions to attend William & Mary. Uh, so I think that uh, being able to see the results of both uh, on-campus uh, housing increases in terms of taking some of that population as well as Midtown Row is going to be really great. And then as a former uh, William Mary student renter and uh, someone who has rented two students, uh, I do support establishing the certification program. Um, and I think the key to uh, to uh, strengthening our neighborhoods is a really open communication uh, on expectations and demonstrating how neighbors can help each other. Uh, for example, when we were talking about the trash uh, uh, carts, uh, I know that um, on days where the trash uh, pickup is, that if I was at work, uh, one of my neighbors would actually uh, pull my cart off, off the street. So it's that, you know, having neighbors that look out for each other is, is really great. So I think the process uh, includes leadership among the uh, landlords, the students, long-term residents at the city and William and & Mary. And with the pandemic, uh, we've seen the benefits of oversight both by William and & Mary and the city, and hopefully that, that will continue. Uh, one of the best examples I know of last year, and I, I think uh, Kayla will recognize this, uh, were several chemistry students who rented a house from a, a local landlord. And the house had been in the family, so all the neighbors uh, knew, knew the landlord. Um, and the lease spelled out what the expectations were and, and it included a maximum number of people in the house at one time. And so the first thing that the students did when they moved in was to introduce themselves to the neighbors. Uh, and they actually went to the farmer's market, picked up peaches, and actually uh, gave those to the neighbors. Well, it was interesting because uh, one of the, the, actually one of the next door neighbors uh, is a retired uh, William and Mary administrator. <laughs> and his wife loves peaches. Uh, so she ended up making uh, peach uh, milkshakes for the students. And then later in the year, and Barb, I heard this story during one of the swim meets, uh, Later in the year, uh, the students need to buy, needed to buy a large presentation board for a project they were working on. And so they went to the, this uh, neighborhood <clears throat> administrator and were able to borrow his truck to go to uh, Home Depot. So ju that just gives you so, some examples of what really can happen if we have a neighborhood uh, working together. And that's all I had, thanks. up to me. So um, I was a, a member of the committee and I was really appreciative for, for being part of it. And Drew, I think that to your point that we had some really good speakers who came in and, and a lot of good concepts, some that we hadn't talked about. And I think that one thing is that you know, the reason that we got to this committee because of neighborhood balance is because some of our historic neighborhoods have gotten so far out of whack with the number of rentals in the neighborhoods. And as a couple residents have pointed out to me, part of it is because it's very easy for an investor to go into a neighborhood and purchase a piece of property. Uh, many of the neighborhoods do not have restrictions as far as the percentage of, of rentals that can be in those neighborhoods. As we have seen, a house goes up and if it's on a great, in a great location for student rentals, it's snapped off of the market sometimes within a week. And, um, and there's no legal way that we can put any caps on the number of rentals that uh, an investor can own. Um, there are some people who own probably more than uh, double digit rental properties in the, in the city. And regardless of how well they're maintained, they are still taking inventory off of, of the market for a single family home. So I looked at the concepts as not only taking into account long-term strategies that might help restore a balance for housing, but also for behavior. 
And so I was really pleased to see the certification um, come to number one. And it sort of goes back to a concept, actually something that the Neighborhood uh, Relationship Committee put into practice a few years ago called Who's Your Landlord? And unfortunately, it didn't get the traction that we had hoped, but it was to identify best practices by landlords and to draw attention to some of those who were, um, who were not taking care of their properties and things like that. So I look forward to that being incorporated. And I'm hopeful that some of the nuisances that we would like to create under a demerit program might be incorporated there or that we can grow upon that. I think one of the restrictions that we'll have with the, the nuisance program is that we will not be allowed to put that into effect because we're a Dillon state. Is that, that's true, Drew? Right, we would need to change the, the Code of Virginia to give us the authority to adopt a true nuisance ordinance. I think your, I think your point is valid. We can just about get to the same destination with the certified rental program if we handle it properly. Yeah, because I know that some of the landlords have um, clauses in their leases for noise, for trash. I mean, I personally have one in my lease for, for trash. If they don't take their carts back, they get fined. And unfortunately, um, it takes finding people to, to make them pay attention. And uh, so I think there are some things that can be done there. And we were talking about the need for funding for some of these programs, whether it be the preservation of the community land trust. And would we, would this perhaps fall under our beautification um, fund that we've established at the Community Foundation, where if some people wanted to contribute to that to be used for preservation, that would be a possibility? Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I was thinking is, um, you know, if we, if we decide to go down one of the paths where funds are created to either do uh, grants or, or loans, uh, we could have some conversations with partners we've already worked with, like the Community Foundation, to determine what their role might be to take some of the administrative burden off of the city. And uh, and thank you. And uh, like Mr. Maslin was saying, I think uh, hopefully the Midtown Road will make a difference. Um, a lot of it comes down to supply and demand. And if the demand for student rentals in the neighborhoods close to campus decreases because of the um, opportunities of Midtown Road, then perhaps some of those owners, landlords will want to divest of their property. And as you and I spoke this morning, I think we also need to, to look at some ways that, um, that landlords could divest of it, whether in, in ways other than just putting it on the market because then we know there are tax implications for those landlords. And if we can be creative with some of these long-term strategies, it might be to, to their benefit as well. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramsey. Mr. Rogers. Sure thing. Thank you very much for that presentation, Drew. I appreciate it. And um, certainly all the work that you oversaw and Barb that you did on the committee and for any uh, Neighborhood Balance Committee members listening, thank you very much for starting pre-pandemic, continuing into the pandemic, and, and now finally giving us these 27 ideas. I certainly think there's a, a wide breadth of, of those to choose from. Uh, I have comments about which ones I'm excited for, which ones I'm hesitant on, but I, I first want to wrap my head around one piece a little bit more that hasn't been uh, discussed yet, and that's the idea for a signature project development overlay. I know the city has a few properties around town, which we eventually would like to be able to sell. Uh, when I personally think of, of when I read about the signature project development overlay, which is quite a mouthful, I thought of the hotel that's up Richmond Road next to the Outback and is abandoned right now. So if we were to go forward with that particularly, what would the process look like on specifying if there could be allowances based on height or density and then providing that to the developer market. Would that be a planning commission decision or a council decision? Would it be driven by staff? What would the process be? Yeah, so I, I think that the, the kickoff would be by city council saying 
we'd like to see this this type of uh, program developed. Um, then what would happen is it's essentially a zoning function. We would draft a zoning ordinance that constructed the overlay and identified what the overlay allowed in terms of density bonuses or height allowances, whatever the case may be. That's what a, just to back up, the signature project uh, development overlay. It is a mouthful. We would definitely rename it, um, but that's what it's called in some other other places. And essentially what it is, it's a tool used to encourage, um, in, in this application, student housing at a particular site where that locality wanted to see redevelopment occur. Um, and so they gave density bonuses or height allowances or reductions in, in uh, floor area ratio requirements to maximize use of the space so that the developers were incentive to incentivized to look there first. Um, so if we applied that here, it would be a zoning ordinance. We would build the overlay um, with those increased allowances included, um, incentivizing different types of development based on what's being provided. And then the council, it would go through the, the typical zoning process of uh, planning commission review, decision, recommendation to city council, city council would have a, uh, a hearing on it. And then as part of that, we would be identifying the properties to apply that overlay to. Okay. Perfect. Thank, thank you for that. I saw, I saw Ms. Shelton nodding, so I didn't get that too terribly wrong. <laughs> uh, that's, that's really helpful to know. And I know that it came about as a decision about student housing. Maybe that could be one that's discussed. I try to think of it in the broader way, too, of right. looking at affordable housing. What's the potential for some of the areas around the city for that idea? Definitely the same application. Yeah, which is which is exciting. I think there's some some potential there. Uh, firstly, I, I wanted to commend the the way one that this process was done, but then also to the way some of the recommendations were provided to us today. It helps me think about it a lot, and I hope it does for the public as well to look at both long term and short term solutions, knowing that some could be implemented in the new year uh, and some may take. 10 years before we see some of the impact from them. I know 10 years was what was listed for the redevelopment assistance and some of the architectural review guidelines. So I, I very much appreciated that difference because I do find some of those camps in with long-term to be likely the ultimate solvents for some of the ratio disparities that we're seeing in the neighborhoods. Uh, I think about the, the land trust, the idea for inclusionary zoning, uh, linkage fees or payment in lieu of what you discussed. So that helps a lot. But but I'm excited for both. And I first, uh, before getting into some of the things I'm excited for and some that I'm hesitant on, uh, wanted also to commend the group for coming together, the 25, I think you said, or, or however many there were, representation from the school and the neighborhoods and being able to regularly meet and listen and to respect other ideas, sometimes uh, Housing, understandable, it can be a really hot topic issue here, and I understand all the group's discussion was, was very helpful. So certainly appreciative of the Neighborhood Balance Committee, and I think the work that it did partially on the affordable front will kick off now very well the Affordable Workforce Task Force jobs into the new year. So, so very much appreciate that, too. Uh, I'd like to reiterate a point that you made earlier, Drew, about neighborhood balance and, and nuisances within the neighborhoods. I've been a student renter, uh, Ted, to your point, I, I have not myself rented to students, but I can tell you that while it is uh, one difficult sometimes to remember to take the trash can up from the road, and I'll be a big fan of the trash can ordinance myself, it's also sometimes difficult to have buy-in to the neighborhood that you've moved into because of an absentee landlord. So I just wanna be honest about us seeing the issue from both sides here. And that's why I'm ultimately really excited for some ideas like the certified rental program, because that both checks students, which can sometimes have the music on a little too loud or leave the trash can by the road, but it can also check the landlords as we do have some, which you know, as you, you made the point, Councilman Ramsey, see an investment in one of our historic neighborhoods, buy and then rent out without really having anything that they put into the home. So uh, I'll start with the, the ideas that I personally think would be ineffective. And it's really the two about the four person moratorium or the potential for uh, repealing it entirely. 
the two arguments that I've heard talked about were that one, the four-person rule in its implementation had housing costs rise in the neighborhoods, and that two, it contributed to noisiness and an overall clutter, you might say, in the neighborhoods because of a greater density. But both of those in the presentation were debunked, really, in showing that in its implementation, the housing costs of neighborhoods did not go up after the four-person rule was implemented, and that since those had been implemented, the 36 houses which have been allowed that allowance over the last many years have only received one noise violation. So I do want to push back on what I can very well understand to be a sort of gut reaction to the four-person rule in recognizing that it has not contributed to higher costs, and it has not, as we've seen, uh, contributed to greater, greater noise or a more boisterous atmosphere in the neighborhoods. Uh, but two more points on the repealing or, or disbanding the allowance. I know some of the people who spoke in front of the Neighborhood Balance Committee mentioned, quite frankly, that a four-person rule or however they might see it, I think it was State College that had the five-person rule, is just quite frankly almost unenforceable because it would take a great deal of staff time or potential new hires to need to go into all of the neighborhoods and enforce that rule to a T, potentially uh, staking out, needing to stake out the houses, which could also, if you project that out, lead to evictions, lead to citations, which could have an incredibly negative impact on town-gown relations. So I, I want people to be, be cognizant of the fact that repealing or even putting a moratorium on that rule could make people very hesitant about the way that the city deals with all of its tenants in the neighborhoods, some of which are tenants, some of which are owners. Uh, and then finally, with Midtown Row coming online, there is some talk about a major change in off-campus housing. I'll be very frank. I think Midtown Row will cause a change in housing in the community. I, I don't necessarily agree with it changing a major, with it causing a major change in the off-campus housing. And, and here's why. I think students who live in off-campus houses, again, uh, I, I was in an off-campus home one year ago, do so for proximity and not so much amenities. My, my home, of which I had an absentee landlord, was not necessarily the Taj Mahal, but it was within walking distance to the stadium and the hospitality house and classrooms. So, so I lived because of proximity, and I think a lot of students will continue living in proximity in the neighborhoods. However, Midtown Row very well and probably will cause a change in students who live farther away, potentially in High Street and Newtown, and students who are living in the dorms of William and Mary as, as students decide, well, I want a sweet lifestyle, uh, sweet meaning S-U-I-T-E, uh, but I don't want an RA and I would love a pool outside. So I think, I think it may pull students out of the campus potentially or farther away housing establishments. I don't necessarily agree that it'll change off-campus housings incredibly uh, in the neighborhoods. And because of that, if we're looking at, well, how do we gauge what Midtown Row will do as far as housing goes for the city? You know, when you run an experiment, you want to change one variable. And that's why I wouldn't support a four person moratorium because you'd be both changing that variable of the off campus housing while also bringing Midtown Row online as it naturally will. I think it'd be better to see it come online, still allow that four person allowance, and then see how houses, housing changes. And again, to reiterate Mayor Pons's point, the four person allowance, one, uh, takes a lot of time to achieve. It's not something that you can get through just a form online, but two, also leads to more inspection of the houses and more of a cognizant about where some of the density could be around town in having city regular inspections. So the four person rule really should be seen as a way to tamper down some of the, the potential boisterousness in the neighborhoods. Shifting now to some of the ideas that I like, all of them have been mentioned before. I think the certified rental program is a fantastic way to both protect the tenants that we have, which are very much members of the community as well, uh, while also checking some of the landlords who may be more absentee and may not put as much emphasis and care into their house as Councilman Ramsey does. I, I also think the trash card ordinance is needed. Uh, like I said, I've had some trouble in the past remembering to take it up. It's a little easier to remember now because I live on one of the entrance corridors, but it's a pretty easy thing to remember. It's a pretty easy thing to do, certainly, and I think a warning or, or maybe even a fine, if necessary, would only take one for it to really click for someone. The town gown report, uh, again, a fantastic idea. I, I'm always an advocate for recognizing 
all that the, the, the community does for each other. And then I'll certainly commend uh, Chief Dunn and his officers in relation to the Adopt-a-Cop program for already the relationship that they have been trying to build without that program formally in place. So again, I, I thank the, the Neighborhood Balance Committee for all of the time that they put into these many ideas. I'm very excited for some of the short-term ones that we have, uh, but also the long-term ones that we have on our, on our plate soon. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Good. Um, well, thank you all. I think we've, we've all given some good feedback. Uh, Mr. Trivet, do you have enough to, to kind of huddle up with the city staff and, and chart a path forward for our recommend uh, consideration? Yeah, I think so. Thank you all. Okay. Do you have a timeline, do you think? You know, I, I talking to Carolyn earlier today, I, it probably we probably won't be back to council with an implementation plan until at least February. Um, as I said, we've got to get past the comprehensive plan components um, so that the staff in the planning office has some time to devote to, to some other concepts. So um, hopefully putting that implementation plan together will a little later in the year will will help provide that. So good. All right. Well, thank you very much. And to all the members of the Neighborhood Balance Committee, I, I to applaud all your efforts to, to come forward and, and, and get us to this point. Um, it is a lot of work and we thank you for that. Okay, so that takes us to item I, uh, five on our agenda, Council Communications. Um, as you know, I serve on the Tourism Council. Recently, um, Supervisor Ruth Larson was appointed chair. Um, that would be the only communications I have. Mr. Dent? Mr. Mass? No. no. Ms. Ramsey? Uh, the only communication I have is just to make sure that people are aware that the EDA roundtable luncheon is this Thursday instead of tomorrow. So it's um, still virtual, so anyone can, can um, attend it. Uh, Cliff Fleet is going to be the, the speaker, so probably of interest to the community, but just wanted to make that point. Thursday, not tomorrow. Uh, Doug, uh, Mayor Pons, nothing about my particular appointments, but could we make uh, an announcement to the community about when the state of the city will be released? Yeah, I was going to cover that uh, in the next item. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that takes us to schedule of meetings, uh, Mr. Trivet. Yeah, so uh, the schedule of meetings, um, we've got the, the ARB meeting virtually, or I should say all of our boards and commissions are now meeting virtually. Um, we've seen a, a substantial increase in the incidence of positive COVID-19 in the region and certainly statewide. And uh, we're seeing it also in the city employee base in the last couple of weeks. So it's, it's pretty alarming. So we decided to go to an all virtual format, which is why we're meeting virtually tonight. All of our meetings will be virtual for the month of December. We'll make a decision about January and February as we get there. The ARB will meet virtually um, uh, tonight. Uh, and then again on the 8th, uh, Economic Development Authority has a meeting at 3 p.m. virtually on the 9th, and then the City Council meeting on the 10th. And then following the City Council meeting on the 10th at 7 p.m., we will be debuting the State of the City Address, um, encouraging all of the residents and interested parties to take a look. Um, it will be a live uh, sort of broadcast of a pre-recorded speech. Um, we've got some interesting new things included in the speech this year, as well as some particular project announcements and uh, some exciting information about the vision of the city. I had planned tonight to show you a little bit of a teaser, um, but I, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid that the quality won't be that great over Zoom. Um, but uh, our PIO, Nicole, is going to be putting out a press release after the meeting tonight that includes that teaser on YouTube. Um, so I encourage everybody to take a look. I think it's a uh, it's going to be very exciting. You know, having seen it um, and participated in it, obviously, I'm, I'm very excited about it. I think it's it's in a format that um, will allow the residents to really, you know, take it all in. You can hit pause and think about things and take notes. And, um, you know, we've got some, um, some extra people going to participate in it this year that I think will, will provide a um, – some input as to what, what's happening in our community. So I really hope that, that people take the opportunity to watch it um, and give us feedback. So thank you for that. 
Anything else, Mr. Trivet? Uh, that's it. Thank you, Mayor. Good. Um, this takes us to open forum. Uh, Mr. Barm or Ms. Felica, do we know if we have anybody else calling in? No, sir, Mayor. There's no one uh, that has called in. Okay. Thank you. I don't have anything else either. Okay. We'll close the, the open forum. Um, I believe we have an item for closed session. Mr. Dent? We do. I move to go into closed session pursuant to section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia for the purpose of discussing one personnel matter per subparagraph one concerning appointments to boards and commissions. Second. Ms. Mr. Lee. Rogers. Yes, Mr. Aye. Rogers. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Okay, and I think we have a, a another invite to go into that closed meeting, so we'll exit out of this meeting and go into that, correct? That's right, but the, the key step is then when we finish closed session, we'll come back to this meeting to certify and adjourn. Yeah. Okay, so we'll make sure we do that in public. Okay, so we're going in now.
call this meeting to order again and whatever I'm supposed to say, I forget now. But Mr. Depp, do you have any a motion for us? I do. I move to approve the certification of a closed session pursuant to section 2.2-3712 of the Code of Virginia. Second. Ms. Felica, please. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Okay. Is there any other business to come forward? Hearing none, is there a motion? I move that the meeting be adjourned. Second. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. We are adjourned.